Good evening. I'm Zamaven of the Eventide, and welcome back to Vampire Read Throughs. We are continuing John William Polydori's The Vampire with a Y. If you missed the first half of the story, just click this thing right here. Go watch the first half, listen to me explain the history of the book, why it's interesting, why it's important, and read the first half, and we're going to read the second half together now. So last we left off our very morally upright Englishman, Aubrey, who has no first name, just Mr. Aubrey, was in Greece doing some archaeology research for funsies and fallen in love with a girl named Ianthe, and she died when he like a fool, didn't come back before dark after going off into the forest uh, to look at some archaeology stuff. And then a big thunderstorm came, and he was riding his horse back. He heard a woman screaming. He went into a hut to save her, but there was a vampire there. We don't know who yet. This all happened shortly after Aubrey found out his traveling buddy, Lord Rutherford, who is absolutely not a vampire, is like a cad and a Don Juan who just seduces girls and turns them slutty. And he's been really jaded and disillusioned. And Aubrey's whole journey here is he went off to Europe to try to become less innocent and try to become more viceful so that he could fit into society better. And I, I guess he's getting there. He's already, you know, been disillusioned about a nobleman and lost the love of his life, lust of his life that he liked to fantasize about a lot, which it says right here on the page. So what's poor Aubrey going to do next? Aubrey, being put to bed, was seized with most violent fever and was often delirious. Oh, well, I guess what he's going to do next is get sick with the grief. In these intervals, he would call upon Lord Ruthven and upon Ianthe. By some unaccountable combination, he seemed to beg his former companion to spare the being he loved. Oh, so he's superimposing Lord Rutherford in his delirious fever upon the murderer he found in the hut, which Aubrey still believes is just a murderer because he found a knife lying on the floor of the hut and not a vampire, even though there were teeth marks on her neck. But all the peasants think it was a vampire. At other times, he would imprecate maledictions upon his head and curse him as her destroyer. Lord Rutherford chanced at this time to arrive in Athens. Oh, how coincidental! And from whatever motive, upon hearing of the state of Aubrey, immediately placed himself in the same house and became his constant attendant. Oh, Lord Rutherford, even though your friend ditched you and called you a jerk and ran away from you, you're still coming to tend him at his sick bed. What a nice vampire. You surely don't have any ulterior motives. When the latter recovered from his delirium, he was horrified and startled at the sight of him whose image he had now combined with that of a vampire. But Lord Rutherford, by his kind words, implying almost repentance for the fault that had caused their separation, and still more by the attention, anxiety, and care which he showed, soon reconciled him to his presence. Oh, he is being a nice vampire. It's like, I don't care that you cock block me back in Italy. I'm still your friend and I'm going to nurse you back to health. His lordship seemed quite changed. He no longer appeared that apathetic being who had so astonished Aubrey. But as soon as his convalescence began to be rapid, he again gradually retired into the same state of mind. And Aubrey perceived no difference from the former man except that at times he was surprised to meet his gaze fixed intently upon him, with a smile of malicious exultation playing upon his lips. Huh. So when Aubrey's really sick, Rutherford's being really nice and he's not being all aloof and mysterious, but as soon as Aubrey starts to get better, he gets aloof and mysterious again and starts sneering at him all sinisterly. Hmm. He knew not why, but this smile haunted him. Maybe because it's a sexy vampire smile and you still want him on some level, Aubrey. During the last stage of the invalid's recovery, Lord Rutherford was apparently engaged in watching the tideless waves raised by the cooling breeze, or in marking the progress of those orbs circling like our world the moveless sun. Indeed, he appeared to wish to avoid the eyes of all. Rutherford's like, oh, my friend's getting better, I'm just going to go stare at the sea and the stars. An introspective, brooding vampire. 
Aubrey's mind, by the shock, was much weakened, and that elasticity of spirit which had once so distinguished him now seemed to have fled forever. You know, I didn't notice his spirit being that elastic before, but you know, if you say so, Polidori, he was now as much a lover of solitude and silence as Lord Rutherford. But much as he wished for solitude, his mind could not find it in the neighborhood of Athens. Oh, that's interesting. So after Aubrey experiences a traumatic event, like the death of his object of his desire, he becomes more vampire-like, as if to say that the vampire is a metaphor for experiencing tragedy. That's interesting. The vampire is that which robs joy from our lives. Even if she were to die by natural causes and you're going through grief, it's still like a vampire has taken away your spirit. The poor Aubrey can't find peace anywhere, can he? If he sought it amidst the ruins he had formerly frequented, Ianthe's form stood by his side. If he sought it in the woods, her light step would appear wandering amidst the underwood, in quest of the modest violet. Then suddenly turning around, would show, to his wild imagination, her pale face and wounded throat, with a meek smile upon her lips. He determined to fly scenes, every feature of which created such bitter associations in his mind. He proposed to Lord Rutherford, to whom he held himself bond by the tender care he had taken of him during his illness, that they should visit those parts of Greece neither had seen yet. They traveled in every direction, and sought every spot to which a recollection could be attached. But though they thus hastened from place to place, yet they seemed not to heed what they gazed upon. See, you're, you're traveling around to Greece, looking at all these gorgeous things, but not even seeing them. To be the vampire and to be like the vampire is not to be able to take in the beauty of the natural earth that's around you, to be cut off from it. They heard much of robbers, but they gradually began to cite these reports, which they imagined were only the invention of individuals whose interest it was to excite the generosity of those whom they defended from pretended dangers. In consequence of thus neglecting the advice of the inhabitants, on one occasion they traveled with only a few guards, more to serve as guides than as defense. Uh-oh. Guys are in for it. You wealthy English lords, the robbers of Greece. Upon entering, however, a narrow defile at the bottom of which was a bed of a torrent with large masses of rock brought down from the neighboring precipices, they had reason to repent their negligence. For scarcely were the whole of the party engaged in the narrow pass when they were startled by the whistling of bullets close to their heads and by the echoed report of several guns. In an instant, their guards had left them. Oh, those jerks! and placing themselves behind rocks had begun to fire in the direction whence the report came. Oh, they're defending them. It's okay. Lord Rutherford and Aubrey, imitating their example, retired for a moment behind the sheltering turn of the defile. But ashamed of being thus detained by a foe who with insulting shouts bade them advance, and being exposed to unresisting slaughter if any of the robbers should climb above them and take them in the rear, oh, that's interestingly worded, they determined at once to rush forward in search of the enemy. Hardly had they lost the shelter of the rock when Lord Rutherford received a shot in the shoulder which brought him to the ground. Oh no, don't shoot the vampire. Aubrey hastened to his assistance and no longer heeding the contest or his own peril was soon surprised by seeing the robbers' faces around him. Oh, Aubrey, you do still love Lord Rutherford. You ran to his safety and now you're in trouble. His guards, having upon Lord Rutherford's being wounded, immediately thrown up their arms and surrendered. Gosh, one guy gets shot and you're going to give up the fight? What kind of wild western story is this? By promises of great reward, Aubrey soon induced them to convey his wounded friend to a neighboring cabin. And having agreed upon a ransom, he was no more disturbed by their presence. Oh, so the robbers are now working for him and he's paying them. I guess it's still robbery, but, you know, at least they're helping the poor wounded vampire. They being content merely to guard the entrance till their comrade should return with the promised sum for which he had an order. See, it's smart of Aubrey. He's not carrying money around on him and just getting shot for it. He's actually sending them to the bank to get even more money when they could have just rubbed the money that was in his pockets. Yeah, you're smart, Aubrey. Lord Rutherford's strength rapidly decreased. In two days, mortification ensued and death seemed advancing with hasty steps. Not mortification got shot in the shoulder and he's dying from it? There aren't any um, vital organs up there. Eh, maybe he's got an infection. His conduct and appearance had not changed. He seemed as unconscious of pain as he had been of the objects about him. 
but towards the close of the last evening, his mind became apparently uneasy, and his eye often fixed upon Aubrey, who was induced to offer his assistance with more than usual earnestness. Assist me! You may save me! You may do more than that! I mean not my life! I heed the death of my existence as little as that of the passing day! But you must save my honor, your friend's honor! How? Tell me how I would do anything, replied Aubrey. I need but little. My life ebbs apace. I cannot explain the whole, but if you would conceal all you know of me, my honor were free from stain in the world's mouth, and if my death were unknown for some time in England, I... I... I but life... Why? Why? Okay. Rutherford's begging Aubrey to preserve his honor. But Aubrey was already like, your honor is ruined. You turned all the girls in England slutty, but I'll do anything to preserve your honor. You know, he doesn't know why this would preserve his honor. It seems still seems weird that he is like all gung-ho for it. Maybe he just feels bad because he's dying. So Rutherford says, don't tell anyone in England I died for a while. Keep it secret. It shall not be known, Aubrey says. Swear, cried the dying man, raising himself with exultant violence. Swear by all your soul reveres, by all your natural fears. Swear that for a year and a day you will not impart your knowledge of my crimes or death to any living being in any way, whatever may happen or whatever you may see. His eyes seemed bursting from their sockets. I swear, said Aubrey. He sunk laughing onto his pillow and breathed no more. So really, one shot in the shoulder from like a regular robber's gun is enough to kill a vampire? So maybe Aubrey is just not supposed to go back to England and like talk about how bad the reputation was. Maybe it's like an open secret, like his guardians knew the bad reputation of Rutherford, but most people don't. Well, you know, he's dead, so Aubrey can not talk about how awful his reputation was for a year and a day. Sure. Poor Aubrey, all your friends are dying. It's probably your fault. I mean, Ianthe probably went out to the woods to look for you because you didn't come back before dark and Rutherin went to this scary part of Greece with you because you, like, couldn't be around where Ianthe died. Do you blame yourself, Aubrey? Lord Byron probably wouldn't blame himself. Aubrey retired to rest but did not sleep. The many circumstances attending his acquaintance with this man rose up in his mind, but he knew not why. When he remembered his oath, a cold shivering came over him, as if from the presentiment of something horrible awaiting him. Rising early in the morning, he was about to enter the hovel in which he had left the corpse when a robber met him and informed him that it was no longer there, having been conveyed by himself and comrades upon his retiring to the pinnacle of a neighboring mount, according to a promise they had given his lordship, that it should be exposed to the first cold ray of the moon that rose after his death. Ah, oh, moonlight. Hmm. Aubrey, astonished and taking several of the men, determined to go and bury it upon the spot where it lay. But when he had mounted to the summit, he found no trace of either the corpse or the clothes, though the robber swore they pointed out the identical rock on which they had laid the body. For a time, his mind was bewildered in conjectures, but he at last returned, convinced that they had buried the corpse for the sake of the clothes. So he's like, what? You just left my friend's body out on a rock? That's not sanitary. I'm going to go bury him. And they're like, we swear we did. And he's like, nah, you stripped him naked and stole his clothes and you buried him. It's okay. He's buried indignantly. Poor Lord Ruthven. But he probably deserved it, because Lord Byron would have deserved it. Weary of a country in which he had met with such terrible misfortunes, and in which all apparently conspired to heighten that superstitious melancholy that had seized upon his mind, he resolved to leave it, and soon arrived in Smyrna. While waiting for a vessel to convey him to Otranto or to Naples, he occupied himself in arranging those effects he had with him belonging to Lord Ruthven. Amongst other things, there is a case containing several weapons of offense, more or less adapted to ensure the death of the victim. There were several daggers and agathins. Whilst turning them over and examining their curious forms, what was his surprise at finding a sheath, apparently ornamented in the same style as the dagger discovered in the fatal hut? He means the one where Ianthe died, the dagger he found on the ground. He shuddered. Hastening to gain further proof, he found the weapon, and his horror may be imagined when he discovered that it fitted. Yes, Polydori, let us just imagine his horror. What? You don't have to tell us about his horror. Lord Byron probably would have told us about his horror, but, you know, why, why waste all those words writing? This is a short story. His horror may be imagined when he discovered that it fitted, though peculiarly shaped the sheath he held in his hand. His eyes seemed to need no further certainty. 
They seemed gazing to be bound to the dagger, yet still he wished to disbelieve. But the particular form, the same varying tints upon the haft and sheath, were alike in splendor on both, and left no room for doubt. There were also drops of blood on each. So yes, it was Lord Rutherford's dagger that he found in the hut where Ianthe died. So, hmm, the person the villagers were accusing of being a vampire, maybe it really was Lord Ruthven, like he dreamed about that very night. You see, when the story was first written, four people in England who maybe weren't that familiar with vampire legends, um, you know, they were around, but it wasn't like a common thing. They would still be reading this being like, nah, vampires aren't real. It can't be, uh, this guy's just, you know, delusional. He's imagining it. To us reading this now, we're like, well, of course the dude's a vampire, obviously, but to them it wasn't obvious. So to them, this would have been exciting. So you can see why this story would have captured the imaginations of people, because they're like, that's not what vampires are like. Vampires are creepy graveyard creatures. They aren't high society lords. Not English lords, surely. Like, at least make him a foreign lord. Jeez, this, this guy, he's got a Scottish name. He's like a laird. He left Smyrna, and on his way home at Rome, his first inquiries were concerning the lady he had attempted to snatch from Lord Ruthven's seductive arts. Her parents were in distress, their fortune ruined, and she had not been heard of since the departure of his lordship. How did he manage that? Wow, this vampire's sinister influence is really far spreading, like he just hangs out with you and you immediately go to ruin. Aubrey's mind became almost broken under so many repeated horrors. He was afraid that this lady had fallen victim to the destroyer of Ianthe. He became morose and silent, and his only occupation consisted in urging the speed of the postulations as if he were going to save the life of someone he held dear. He arrived at Calais, a breeze, which seemed obedient to his will, soon wafted him to the English shores, and he hastened to the mansion of his fathers, and there, for a moment, appeared to lose in the embraces and caresses of his sister all memory of the past. If she before, by her infantine caresses, had gained his affection, now that the woman began to appear, she was still more attaching as a companion. Wow, Aubrey, you're like, oh, my sister was great when she was a kid, but now that she's an adult, she's, she's even more attaching, uh, you hot for your sister, Aubrey? Oh, gothic. Miss Aubrey had not that winning grace which gains the gaze and applause of the drawing room assemblies. There was none of that light brilliancy which only exists in the heated atmosphere of a crowded apartment. Her blue eye was never lit up by the levity of the mind beneath. There was a melancholy charm about it, which did not seem to arise from misfortune, but from some feeling within that appeared to indicate a soul conscious of a brighter realm. Oh, she's also not like the other girls. She's deep. She doesn't like twinkle and sparkle and levity. She's got melancholy from her soul. Her step was not that light footing which strays wherever a butterfly or a color may attract. It was sedate and pensive. When alone, her face was never brightened by the smile of joy, but when her brother breathed to her his affection and would in her presence forget those griefs she knew destroyed his rest, who would have exchanged her smile for that of the voluptuary? I like that word, voluptuary. We should use that word more often. Yeah, you know, normally she's really serious and kind of emo, but when her brother is there, she's just so happy. Her smile means more than anything. It seemed as if those eyes, that face, were then playing in the light of their own native sphere. She was yet only 18 and had not been presented to the world, it having been thought by her guardians more fit that her presentation should be delayed until her brother's return from the continent, when he might be her protector. It was now, therefore, resolved that the next drawing room, which was fast approaching, should be the epic of her entry into the busy scene. Aubrey would rather have remained in the mansion of his father's and fed upon the melancholy which overpowered him. He could not feel interest about the frivolities of fashionable strangers when his mind had been so torn by the events he had witnessed, but he determined to sacrifice his own comfort to the protection of his sister. They soon arrived in town and prepared for the next day, which had been announced as a drawing room. That means a party, because in oldie times, women weren't allowed to exist in public until they were presented and had their coming out party, and then they were allowed to be in public, which means open season on them for getting married. But of course she needs her brother's protection. She's just so innocent and not like the other girls. She can't take care of herself. The crowd was excessive. A drawing room had not been held for a long time, and all who were anxious to bask in the smile of royalty hastened thither. 
Aubrey was there with his sister. While he was standing in a corner by himself, heedless of all around him, engaged in the remembrance that the first time he had seen Lord Ruthven was in that very place, he felt himself suddenly seized by the arm and a voice he recognized too well sounded in his ear. Remember your oath. He had hardly courage to turn, fearful of seeing a specter that would blast him when he perceived at a little distance the same figure which had attracted his notice on the spot upon his first entry into society. He's seeing Lord Revan. What? He's alive? Or is it a ghost? He gazed till his limbs, almost refusing to bear their weight, he was obliged to take the arm of a friend. Enforcing a passage through the crowd, he threw himself into a carriage and was driven home. Did he leave his sister there? I guess she'll be okay. He paced the room with hurried steps and fixed his hands upon his head as if he were afraid his thoughts were bursting from his brain. Lord Rutherford again before him. Circumstances started up in a dreadful array. The dagger, his oath. He roused himself. He could not believe it possible. The dead rise again? The shawl. He thought his imagination had conjured up the image his mind was resting upon. It was impossible that it could be real. He determined, therefore, to go again into society. For though he attempted to ask concerning Lord Rutherford, the name hung upon his lips, and he could not succeed in gaining information. He went a few nights after with his sister to the assembly of a near relation. Leaving her under the protection of a matron, he retired into a recess, and there gave himself up to his own devouring thoughts. Perceiving at last that many were leaving, he roused himself, and entering another room, found his sister surrounded by several apparently in earnest conversation. Oh, go sister! You th I thought you were like a wallflower who wasn't like the other girls and didn't have like levity in your conversation, but hey, everyone's talking to you. Maybe Aubrey should give you more credit. He attempted to pass and get near her when one whom he requested to move turned around and revealed to him those features he most abhorred a.k.a. Lord Rutherford's features. I almost said Lord Byron's features. Well, it would have been the same thing. Tell us how you really feel, Polidori. He sprang forward, seized his sister's arm, and with hurried step forced her towards the street. At the door, he found himself impeded by the crowd of servants who were waiting for their lords. And while he was engaged in passing them, he again heard that voice whisper close to him, Remember your oath. He did not dare turn, but hurrying, his sister soon reached home. Aubrey became almost distracted. If before his mind had been absorbed by one subject, how much more completely was it engrossed now that the certainty of the monsters living again pressed upon his thoughts? His sister's attentions were now unheeded, and it was in vain that she entreated him to explain to her what had caused his abrupt conduct. He only uttered a few words, and those terrified her. The more he thought, the more he was bewildered. His oath startled him. Was he then to allow this monster to roam? Bearing ruin upon his breath amidst all he held dear and not avert its progress? His very sister might have been touched by him. But even if he were to break his oath and disclose his suspicions, who would believe him? He thought of employing his own hand to free the world from such a wretch. But death, he remembered, had already been mocked. For days he remained in this state. Shut up in his room, he saw no one and ate only when his sister came, who, with eyes streaming with tears, besought him for her sake to support nature. At last, no longer capable of bearing stillness and solitude, he left his house, roamed from street to street, anxious to fly that image which haunted him. His dress became neglected, and he wandered, as often exposed to the noonday sun as to the midnight damps. He was no longer to be recognized. At first he returned with the evening to the house, but at last he laid him down to rest wherever fatigue overtook him. Poor Aubrey, the vampire's just driving you to the edge. You're just sleeping in the streets now. His sister, anxious for his safety, employed people to follow him, but they were soon distanced by him who fled from a pursuer swifter than any from thought. His conduct, however, suddenly changed. Struck with the idea that he left by his absence the whole of his friends with a fiend amongst them of whose presence they were unconscious, he determined to enter again into society and watch him closely, anxious to forewarn, in spite of his oath, all whom Lord Ruthven approached with intimacy. You go, Aubrey. That, that, that is the right choice. You know, he had to have his gothic moment of wallowing in angst, wandering the streets in derelict dress, sleeping wherever, and then he was like, you know what? I'm just letting him prey on all my friends. I'll go back and protect them now. But 
When he entered into our room, his haggard and suspicious looks were so striking, his inward shuddering so visible that his sister was at last obliged to beg of him to abstain from seeking, for her sake, a society which affected him so strongly. When, however, remonstrance proved unavailing, the guardians thought proper to interpose, and fearing that his mind was becoming alienated, they thought it high time to resume again that trust which had been before imposed upon them by Aubrey's parents. Oh, so his guardians, his step-parents are finally like, yeah, maybe we should take care of this kid? You know, he's, he's kind of acting weird. We should do something about it. Desirous of saving him from the injuries and sufferings he had daily encountered in his wanderings, and of preventing him from exposing to the general eye those marks of what they considered folly, they're like, <laughs> Aubrey, you're embarrassing us in public. Please stop. They engaged a physician to reside in the house and take constant care of him. He hardly appeared to notice it. So completely was his mind absorbed by one terrible subject. His incoherence became at last so great that he was confined to his chamber. There he would often lie for days, incapable of being roused. He'd become emaciated. His eyes had attained a glassy luster. The only sign of affection and recollection remaining displayed itself upon the entry of his sister. Then he would sometimes start, and seizing her hands with looks that severely afflicted her, he would desire her not to touch him. Oh, do not touch him. If your love for me is aught, do not go near him. Him being Lord Ruthven. When, however, she inquired to whom he referred, his only answer was, True! True! And again he sank into a state, whence not even she could rouse him. This lasted many months. Gradually, however, as the year was passing, his incoherencies became less frequent, and his mind threw off a portion of its gloom, whilst his guardians observed that several times in the day he would count upon his fingers a definite number and then smile. We know why he's counting. Lord Rutherin made him sit, say an oath for a year and a day not to reveal his secrets. It's interesting that Aubrey is sticking to that oath because he thought about breaking the oath. So it's clearly it's not that the oath that matters. And we have to wonder if it's some kind of vampire hypnosis. If when Aubrey agreed to that oath, it did some vampire magic power that made it impossible for him to talk about. It's a pretty common thing where if you're afflicted by a vampire, you just like physically can't talk about it and you can't get that out. You see that vampire trope a lot in modern stories too. It was used in The Quick by Lauren Owen, which we just read for the Vampire Book Club. If you like vampire stories, you should join the Vampire Book Club. I posted a two hour video recently about our discussion about The Quick by Lauren Owen. So go and watch that. Back to the story. The time had nearly elapsed when upon the last day of the year, one of his guardians entering his room began to converse with his physician upon the melancholy circumstance of Aubrey's being in so awful a situation when his sister was going next day to be married. Instantly, Aubrey's attention was attracted. He asked anxiously, to whom? Glad of this mark of returning intellect of which they feared he had been deprived, they mentioned the name of Earl of Marsden. Thinking this was a young Earl with whom he had met within society, Aubrey seemed pleased, and astonished them still more by his expressing his attention to be present at the nuptials, and desiring to see his sister. They answered not, but in a few minutes his sister was with him. He was apparently again capable of being affected by the influence of her lovely smile, for he pressed her to his breast and kissed her cheek, wet with tears, flowing at the thought of her brother's being once more alive to the feelings of affection. He began to speak with all his wanted warmth and to congratulate her upon her marriage with a person so distinguished for a rank and every accomplishment when he suddenly perceived a locket upon her breast. Opening it, what was his surprise at beholding the features of the monster who had so long influenced his life? He seized the portrait in a paroxysm of rage and trampled it under his foot. Upon asking him why he thus destroyed the resemblance of her future husband, he looked as if he did not understand her. Then, seizing her hands and gazing on her with a frantic expression of countenance, he bade her swear that she would never wed this monster, for he... But he could not advance. It seemed as if that voice again bade him remember his oath. He turned suddenly round, thinking Lord Ruthven was near him, but saw no one. Yeah, definitely some kind of vampire hypnosis thing going on. In the meantime, the guardians and physician who had heard the whole and thought this was but a return of his disorder entered, and forcing him from Miss Aubrey, desired her to leave him. He fell upon his knees to them. He implored. He begged of them to delay, but for one day. 
They, attributing this to the insanity they imagined had taken possession of his mind, endeavored to pacify him and retired. So Miss Aubrey thinks she's marrying this Earl guy, but the picture of her husband in her locket is Lord Rutherford. I mean, a vampire would never use a false identity. Now they do. Thanks to this story, another very common vampire trope that we see in a lot of modern day vampire fiction. Like Dracula spelling his name backward. Earl of Marsden isn't any kind of anagram of Lord Rutherford, but same idea. Lord Rutherford had called the morning after the drawing room and had been refused with everyone else. When he heard of Aubrey's ill health, he readily understood himself to be the cause of it. But when he learned that he was deemed insane, his exultation and pleasure could hardly be concealed from those among whom he had gained this information. You jerk, you could at least hide the fact that like, yes, he's insane now. Now I can do what I want with my vampire plans. He hastened to the house of his former companion, and by constant attendance and the pretense of great affection for the brother and interest of his fate, he gradually won the ear of Miss Aubrey. Who could resist his power? Oh, Polidori, are you thinking about Byron again? His tongue had dangers and toils to recount, could speak of himself as of an individual having no sympathy with any being on the crowded earth, save with her to whom he addressed himself. Oh, he makes her feel like the only girl in the world. Could tell how, since he knew her, his existence had begun to seem worthy of preservation. If it were merely that he might listen to her soothing affects. In fine, he knew so well how to use the serpent's art, or such was the will of fate, that he gained her affections. The title of the elder branch falling at length to him, he obtained an important embassy, which served as an excuse for hastening the marriage, in spite of her brother's deranged state, which was to take place the very day before his departure for the continent. Aubrey, when he was left by the physician and his guardians, attempted to bribe the servants, but in vain. He asked for pen and paper. It was given him. He wrote a letter to his sister, conjuring her as she valued her own happiness, her own honor, and the honor of those now in the grave who once held her in their arms as their hope and the hope of their house, to delay, but for a few hours, that marriage on which he denounced the most heavy curses. The servants promised they would deliver it, but giving it to the physician, he thought it better not to harass any more the mind of Miss Aubrey by what he considered the ravings of a maniac. Oh, it's the physician's fault. Night passed on without rest to the busy inmates of the house, and Aubrey heard, with a horror that may more easily be conceived than described, the notes of busy preparation. Again, Polidori? You're not even going to describe the horror? Lord Byron would have described the horror. I think that's like, what, the fourth time now Polidori says something like, I'm not going to bother describing it. You, you could just conceive it better than I can describe it. Maybe that's why you didn't get literary notoriety. Or the fact that you drank yourself to death by the age of 25, you know, could have been one of those things. Morning came, and the sound of carriages broke upon his ear. Aubrey grew almost frantic. The curiosity of the servants at last overcame their vigilance. They gradually stole away, leaving him in the custody of a helpless old woman. He seized the opportunity, with one bound was out of the room, and in a moment found himself in the apartment where all was nearly assembled. Lord Ruthven was the first to perceive him. He immediately approached, and taking his arm by force, hurried him from the room, speechless with rage. How dare you try to spoil my vampire plans, my vampire wedding. You see, vampires want brides. They just, they just want to get married. At least now they do, before they were just like graveyard monsters. This is so much more romantic which makes it so much more horrifying. When you have something like a monster rising from its grave, sucking your blood and then going back to its grave, yeah, that's scary. But when you have a monster that you fall for and think is romantic and then realize you're deceived, that's like a whole new level of horror. A whole new level of horror. Thank you, the vampire with a Y. When on the staircase, Lord Rutherford whispered in his ear, remember your oath and know, if not my bride today, your sister is dishonored. Women are frail. As if like, if I don't marry her now, she'll be ruined and considered a slut because our marriage didn't go through. So, you know, it's your choice. I, she can either marry a vampire or just have her reputation ruined forever. Women are frail, as in women's reputations are frail. Not women themselves. But society, so gothic. So saying, he pushed Aubrey toward his attendants, who, roused by the old woman, had come in search for him. Aubrey could no longer support himself. His rage, not finding vent, had broken a blood vessel, and he was conveyed to bed. Wow, he just, like, 
anime head exploded because he was so upset that he couldn't yell at Ruffin in front of everybody. You're between, like, a rock and a hard place. Between a vampire and a misogynist place. I mean, so gothic. This was not mentioned to his sister, who was not present when he entered as the physician was afraid of agitating her. This physician's like, yeah, you know, Aubrey's saying all these warnings. He just popped a blood vessel. Uh, I'm just not going to tell the sister. You know, the women can't handle it. She, she'll be too agitated. Let's just not tell her that her brother's like about to die. The marriage was solemnized and the bride and bridegroom left London. Aubrey's weakness increased. The effusion of blood produced symptoms of the near approach of death. He desired his sister guardians be called, and when the midnight hour had struck, he related composedly what the reader has perused. He died immediately after. The guardians hasted to protect Miss Aubrey, but when they arrived, it was too late. Lord Ruthven had disappeared, and Aubrey's sister had glutted the thirst of a vampire. Dun dun dun! Vampire, with a Y, in all caps. That's how it ends. See, the Guardians were the one that originally wrote to Aubrey and were like, stop hanging out with Ruthven. He's a jerk that turns all the women in London slutty. But then they let Ruthven marry the sister. <sighs> the fools. So that was The Vampire, with a Y, by John William Polidori, Lord Byron's biffle slash frenemy slash doctor who stood on Byron's coattails, took Byron's outline of a short story that he abandoned, added vampires into it, and changed the course of vampire history. And we have this story to thank for every single other popular vampire trope that wound up becoming famous in pop culture. Yes, there were other vampires before this. Yes, there were other vampires not influenced by this. Like, Carmilla was mostly influenced by Christabel, for instance. But without the vampire, we wouldn't have had Dracula and we wouldn't have had history and I wouldn't be here. So thank you for joining me for this vampire read through. If you enjoy this and would like to read more vampire stories together, let me know in the comments what stories you would be interested in. The more obscure and historically relevant, the better. I love digging into that stuff and figuring out where these ideas started and how they evolved into the vampires we know and love today. original short story that Lord Byron started and abandoned. It's been published. It's usually called A Fragment. Just look up A Fragment by Lord Byron. It's like the one thing that's not poetry and you can read it. You can see the similarities even though there's no vampires. There's still like two guys traveling and then one dies and one's like swear an oath you won't tell anything about me and that's where it ends but Byron had told Polydori that the guy was going to come back and prey upon his sister so you know Polydori took it and ran with it. But you can look that up Thank you to my Patreon patrons for supporting me and making my YouTube channel possible. It would not exist without them. So if you can't become a Patreon patron, at least say thank you to them because they're the ones that brought us here. I hope you are all staying safe and healthy and taking care of your vampires. Until we meet again, good night.